I have to tell you, I've been surprised, really pleasantly surprised with, with what I've heard here this time. This is about my third Starmus. <coughs> but, uh, for example, uh, Chris Hadfield this morning, it's, it's the most informative and the best that I have heard about uh, uh, the EVA suits and the like. But it's because the world today, in my opinion, has kind of changed. When Apollo uh, is mentioned today, uh, the public in general, and not necessarily this crowd, because <coughs> you guys are interested in space, right? I don't think you'd be here. But the public recalls, oh, maybe Apollo 11. Uh, immediately they'll do that. Apollo 8, possibly. Sometimes Apollo 13. Remember they had that, uh, that movie was made about Apollo 13, and people remember that. Uh, they will rarely recall Apollo 7 or Apollo 9. And that's because those were the two Apollo missions that were conducted right here in Earth orbit. And uh, I guess that's why it doesn't enter their minds. Uh, <coughs> but both of those test missions played a critical role in the most historic achievement in our nation's history, landing a man on the moon. <coughs> Today I'm going to uh, I'll speak both on missions and on some factors that I think helped make Apollo great. You know, like motivation, attitude, inspirational factors. And I will encourage you to ask questions. Any topic, any subject, I might even be able to answer them. <coughs> we have had some impressive space programs after Apollo. And uh, the shuttle, uh, in my opinion, and that's not shared un unanimously. It was the greatest flying machine in the history of our country. The International Space Station, well, I think it's the most impressive manned satellite ever. It's hard to find anybody that would disagree with that. With more space science today than we ever had before, why, why is space not a bigger factor in today's society? What has changed, really? Well, uh, our society is changing, whether we like it or not. Apollo was a story of exploration and adventure. My generation had the opportunity and the courage to look around the moon and reach for the stars. We didn't shy away from the unknown, and we were willing to take a risk. We were exploring the next frontier. And today, the entire world, it takes pride in what we, <coughs> excuse me, what was man's greatest adventure. Some of you might ask, you know, what, what was an adventure? Well, I liked what a Frenchman by the name of Delage, he, in December of 1994, he held a press conference to announce that he was going to swim the Atlantic. And when he was asked why, he said, because it is an adventure. Then he explained. Whoops. Then he explained. To be an adventure, you've got to satisfy three conditions. Must advance human knowledge, must have a real risk of dying, and it must have an uncertain outcome. Well, that was the Apollo program, to land a man on the moon. And uh, I have to tell you, uh, the uh, Frenchman by the name of Delage, he uh, set out to uh, do some of those things also. Let's see, the uh, 500 years ago, the next frontier was the New World. And the New World, excuse me, 15th and 16th centuries, it was uh, England and Spain and Portugal. They were crossing the seas to expand their country's greatness. And Ferdinand Magellan, uh, he was going to set, set foot, set sail on one of the most famous voyages of exploration in history. Monsieur Magellan, he had this to say. He said, it is with an iron will that we embark on the most daring of all endeavors, to meet the shadowy future without fear, and to conquer the unknown. And <coughs> That was to going to be the first voyage around 
the world. And as the exploration of the new world was inevitable 500 years ago, well, I can say this, so too is our exploration of space. This, the uh, new ocean space, that's more pristine than was the new world before the voyages of Columbus and Magellan. In the 1960s, we reached for the heavens to open up the next frontier. A frontier whose farthest shores we can never reach out there. And while the voyages of Columbus and Magellan, they took years, astronauts make that same trip around the world in 90 minutes. It wasn't always that way. Back in 1960, that's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, many predicted an absolute catastrophe for man in space. Some doctors thought that man's kidneys or his liver might fail, or that our eyes would change shape, which some of them did a bit. The, uh, in spite of that, in 1961, a group of Americans decided and announced to the world that America was going to the moon. And within 10 years, then President Kennedy announced, I'll quote him here, we will land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth in this decade. We choose to do this not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Now that statement seemed incredulous to the world at that time. That might seem a little bit different in the programs we've already seen here in talking about that, because I find that the discussion of exploration here is different than many things that I learned over the last 50 years. <coughs> we were throwing down a gauntlet before the Soviet Union, and it was challenging them to a technological fight to the finish. And at the time that statement was made, not a single American had yet been in orbit. <coughs> The uh, President Kennedy was willing to take a risk. And it wasn't just a technical risk and a human risk. It was also an economic risk and a political risk. It took initiative and it took leadership. And today, that goal is history. Fifty years ago, fifty years ago it became another milestone in the history of America. All right, I've got to show you Kennedy there. There he's talking at Rice University. And on the moon, and only 193 years after establishing an American flag on this planet, we had planted it on a foreign body in the universe. And while our engineers, managers, and astronauts were willing to risk failing, Believe me, we never thought of failing. That doesn't mean we ignored the, the, the risk, but we never ignored, we never thought about uh, failing, period. We were racing our competition to land a man on the moon, and we refused to lose to anyone or anything. I think it might have been related to a fighter pilot attitude, which is what we all were in those days. <coughs> So glad, so glad that I was there. We shared a common dream to test the limits of man's imagination and his daring. That attitude, that enabled us to overcome every obstacle in one of the most challenging and risky endeavors in history. And that wasn't just uh, for Americans. The entire world takes pride in man's greatest adventure. Any, any project as complex as Apollo requires three things, the resources, the technology, and the will to do it. Driven by the Cold War, all three of these things came together in the 1960s and we went to the moon. That was only three generations between man's first flight off the surface of the Earth and man's first orbit around the Earth. And that first man, incidentally, was Yuri Gagarin, the Russian. It wasn't us. We were almost a year behind on that part. Today, we've raised two generations 
for whom man's first flight into space is only something that uh, they read about in the history books. You might ask, why was the job of riding a flaming rocket into orbit exclusively for fighter pilots and test pilots, all in their 30s? Well, at the time, that was considered too tough for anyone much older than that. And it was thought that only an experienced and youthful fighter pilot could endure the wear and tear. It was a young man's game, or so we thought in those days. <clears throat> and when Wally Shara, commander on my mission, when he left NASA, he was the oldest active astronaut at the age of 43. Today, the average age in the astronaut office is over, I'm kind of guessing, over 45 years, the average age of it. Back in those good old days, we were hired based on our experience and our qualifications. We were all highly motivated, competitive self-starters. As fighter pilots, we had received uh, pre-screening and filtering in, in military careers of a dozen years or more where we spent our lives facing risk. And to many of us, that was the appealing aspect of that job. And we knew that we could depend on each other for our lives. So how did I, uh, how did I become one of the first 30 astronauts? Or some of you may prefer to ask why. Don't know. <laughs> In 1961, I was a Marine Corps fighter pilot, had about 2,000 hours in jet, jet fighters, and I was working on a doctorate in physics at UCLA. And uh, working part-time at the Rand Corporation. I'd, been, I'd read about the Mercury astronauts, and I'd envied them. <coughs> and uh, well, I'm not sure I want to tell this story. I'll be in trouble at home if I tell this story. But uh, on 5 May 1961, I was driving to work at the Rand Corporation. And it was before 7, over the Santa Monica Mountains. They didn't have a freeway there then. <coughs> and I was listening on the radio to Alan Shepard's countdown that morning, a little before 10 where he was. When it got down to the last five minutes, I parked at the side of the road. I couldn't keep driving anymore and uh, got down to five four three two one lift off and I heard this voice screaming out around me you lucky SOB it wasn't abbreviating it and then I realized, I started looking around, I realized that was me doing the screaming and I was just so glad that there was nobody out there listening to me. The, uh, that's uh, Freedom 7 that, uh, that he was lifting off for that uh, suborbital mission, but I, it, it, it really touched me. Uh, so, but who knows what happens. Anyway, two and a half years, two and a half years? Yeah, two and a half years later, I was sharing an office with that same Alan Shepard. And in 1963, I was one of 770 qualified applicants for the third group of astronauts. And I ended up being one of the 14 that got selected. Well, they sure look different. And there's only a few of us that are still alive. My observations on our group in those days, I'd say we were all bright, healthy, in good physical condition, motivated, competitive, self-starters. We had a strong feeling of self-identity and self-confidence. I could say we were aware of where we were going and how we would get there. That might be referred to just as ego. But some may have thought, I don't know, can't speak for everybody, but some may have thought that fame and fortune lay ahead. Well, the reality of that situation is uh, three years later, four of our 14 uh, were already dead. Uh, and for details, I would just refer you to my book, The All-American Boys. 
Why did we become astronauts? Well, I can tell you this. It wasn't for the money. So <coughs> uh, put that in, into calibration here. I can tell you this, that uh, uh, let's see, it was, uh, I can't remember how many years before that, but I was on active duty in the Marine Corps and to, uh, in order to uh, get a degree, I, I won't tell you an interesting story about why I decided I had a degree. Out of high school, I joined, I joined the Navy, managed to pass a two-year college test, decided to go in the Marine Corps. I was over in Korea, and uh, <coughs> the lousiest captain we had, I was the second lieutenant, the lousiest captain we had when I was over there, made major, and the best major that all of us guys ex admired, really admired a lot. He had been reselected, now he was a captain. So the next day I decided I was gonna go to college. So it was uh, pretty interesting. To do that, it took me another year and a half or two years to transfer into the reserve. And that left me as a civilian when I joined NASA. Because I was a classified as a civil servant. I managed to maintain my time in the reserves, and I, th I think when I retired, I had 23 or 24 years of, of duty. But to show you how rich it made us, I went to work. I went to work for uh, $13,050 a year. And to show you how rewarding that was, when I left almost uh, eight years later, I was all the way up to $25,000 a year. And uh, I calculated back in those days, during the 11 days of Apollo 7, when we flew, I calculated it out, and I had earned almost $660. <laughs> Hell, at 50 cents a mile, I would have made two and a quarter million. Oh, one other factor on it, I should tell you this. Uh, the, the civilians among us, and you get another one of the civilians you're going to hear from here in a little bit, Rusty Schweiker. Uh, we uh, had no uh, life insurance. We had no life insurance because they had just uh, updated the, uh, uh, for the whole uh, space agency the uh, life insurance. And the difference in price, which whether they included the four of us civilians that were in the astronaut group, if they had included us or left us out, uh, that made a big difference because they wouldn't do it if they included us four because it would raise everybody's life insurance way too much. But I can tell you this. <coughs> that was one of the world's greatest jobs, believe me. The 60s and 70s, as we look back, that was the golden age of manned space flight. It was kind of like the 1920s in aviation. The, uh, we had no biplanes and no silk scarves that trailed out of the, the cockpit that was open in there. But we, f we felt like it. Well, maybe I shouldn't say we. Most of us felt like that in the flying. And uh, with 30 astronauts, and we had 30 T-38s, it was the last great flying club, believe me. We loved flying airplanes, and we loved riding rockets. And not the least of our motivations back then was doing something for our country. And like the feelings of my boyhood hero, Charles Lindbergh, he was the first man to fly the Atlantic solo back in uh, 1927. I met him about 40 years after that. But here's what he said in 1969. Quote, as a student pilot at the age of 20, when aviation was much more dangerous than it is today, I concluded that if I could fly for 10 years before being killed in a crash, I would be willing to trade an ordinary lifetime for that experience. And I think that's how we felt about riding rockets into space. And it's a good thing that we did. In five years, we had lost seven of our 30 in aircraft and spacecraft accidents. And in the 50 years, 50 years since that time, only 13 more of our 30 are gone. So uh, it's a good thing we, we were used to it. 
most noteworthy loss was the Apollo 1 fire on the pad. Several people have mentioned it in the last two days. Three good men paid the price for progress, and I lost three good friends, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. And it was just, it was, it was different, because what happens is we were, on, we were their backup crew at the time that happened. And we made it to the backup crew by spending, uh, well, the preceding seven or eight months, we had been the prime crew on what was called Apollo 2. Well, the contractor had so many things that we were organizing to get fixed and what have you, they ended up canceling out our mission. And at that point, we became the backup crew for Apollo 1. In fact, they, they got killed in that uh, accident, that test that they were doing on the down at the Cape. We had done that test the night before, but uh, we didn't uh, have to close the hatch because we weren't on 100% oxygen on it. So it's, uh, it was really sad to see that happen. The, um, we lost, you know, three good friends, Grissom, White, and Chaffee there. And I'd say this, the cause, they've, they've thought they've come up with it. I worked on the accident report for a while, but I don't think they ever really pinned it down exactly to what it was. But I think that maybe over our overconfidence might have been one of the factors, because we were so anxious to beat the Russians at the time. And it, it, we had no idea exactly how close it was. At least our office didn't, but a few other people may have. And uh, that was it. So anyhow, uh, we then spent, well, during that time, we had spent uh, lots of time. Those months, we'd spent them on uh, uh, working on design, manufacturing, testing at the North American plant out in California. And the... Uh, after that crew died, it was three months after we became the backup crew on that, and then we were assigned, you know, a couple of weeks later, we were assigned the first mission, which we more appropriately had called Apollo 7, which was included the, the manned and unmanned launches up until that time. And 21 months later, yep, there it is, 21 months later, we had uh, about... After 1,040 changes uh, in that spacecraft, we lifted off in a very ambitious effort to make up for lost time. That was 21 months that we had taken out of that schedule, and we had been, one of the reasons we were pur pushing the schedule as much as we were before that is to make sure we beat the Russians there. And we didn't have enough knowledge, actually, of what was going off on, on the uh, Russian program. So... This the first mission. It was a planned 11 days uh, to test all of the propulsion systems, spacecraft systems, docking systems, rendezvous maneuvers, ground systems, and probably several other different areas in there too. The uh, uh, the this is uh, this this picture here is is one one of my favorites, and. Uh, we survived, to our surprise, actually, we survived the full 11 days, <coughs> and the operations, we uh, were running them smooth enough. It was taking a lot of our time, but it was running us smooth enough that we would added four mission objectives during those 11 days, added it on to that. And when we landed, uh, that was 104%, well, we were only 100, I think 101% successful, and it was, uh, it was judged 101% successful mission. And to this day, 50, almost 51 years later, Apollo 7 is still the longest, most ambitious, most successful first test flight of any new flying machine ever. Personally, I think it was an amazingly good spacecraft. Oh, yeah. I should let you know about this. There's, uh, I can't look at this without realizing how much we've been able to improve the lousy kind of pictures that we used to get back 50 years later. But that, whatever that was, it was good enough that we got the first live TV from space. And so they gave us an Emmy, and NASA wouldn't let us fly out to Hollywood to get it. Mine arrived in a carton <laughs> about, a month, about a month later. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm frequently asked, 
were you afraid? Well, afraid of the mission? No. The only fear that I can recall at the time was fear of failure. And I think that each member of our team had that same thought. If this mission fails, it won't fail because of me. We weren't afraid of accepting the challenge, but having accepted it, we were afraid of being found lacking by our peers. I do recall that. Uh, here's the five. I, I, I look at the mission maybe different than, than the government ever did, but I look at those five giant steps to land man on the moon, and uh, everyone on our team understood that plan at th in those days. Uh, Apollo 7, you look in that upper left-hand corner, uh, that was develop and test the systems and operations. Uh, Apollo 8, which you, you're probably more familiar with, uh, that was the first time that we escaped the Earth's gravitational pull. And no matter what they try to tell you, they it couldn't have landed on the moon. It didn't have the stuff. Uh, Apollo 9, that was to test the lunar module in Earth's orbit. Uh, and of course, Apollo 9, it, they were testing the lunar module. Very important. Maybe the most critical test we could possibly have. No heat shield. So you had to be able to get back and dock in order to stay alive. And they did on Apollo 9. Because <coughs> <coughs> they had no reentry capability. We did, at least on 7. Apollo 10. I think down there. Okay. Apollo 10. That was uh, down to about 40, 48, 50,000 feet above the surface of the moon. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Today, some of the folks like to say, well, maybe they could have landed or they were thinking about it, what have you. Uh, the spacecraft really was too heavy and too little fuel to be able to land and, and, and get off. So uh, that didn't happen then either. But Apollo 11, you're seeing there, they flew that last 50,000 feet for the first lunar landing. And when Apollo 11 touched down, with 17 seconds of fuel remaining, we all started breathing again. And Neil Armstrong, he stepped off into history. When, uh, when, the, po when the Apollo program really is mentioned today, probably <coughs> you probably immediately think of uh, Neil's words, you know, a small step for man, a giant leap for mankind. And that's one for the history books. I sometimes think of uh, statements of some of the other crew members. Uh, for example, uh, Apollo 17, that last mission. Uh, <coughs> and I, I don't remember how long after we, they came back and landed, but the crew, they were addressing uh, Congress. And Jack Schmidt was speaking in Congress. He was the only geologist to go to the moon. And I, uh, I saved this speech and carried it with me a little bit. And he's uh, addressing a joint session of Congress, and he has this to say. He says, and quote, I would like first to tell you about a place I have seen in the solar system, the Valley of Taurus Litro. And then, going on, he said, this valley has been less changed by our being there than we have been changed for having made the journey. And I think now you can recognize that in your society and your people that you know. Uh, also, you may not know that uh, we ca they carried microfilm messages. You know, that was how, we, how small things got in those days. Microfilm messages from the leaders of all the free nations of the world. And they were left on the moon by Apollo 11. A couple of months after they got back, I got a chance to look at those messages, and I carried one with me for years. They were by the, from the leaders of the free nations. And this was the, the one that was carried by uh, the, uh, Jack Gordon. He was the prime minister of Australia. And here I had a couple sentences of, of praise, two sentences of praise, I think. Then he went on to say, may the high courage and technical genius which made this achievement possible be so used in the future that mankind will live in a world in which peace, self-expression, 
and the chance of dangerous adventure are available to all. What a wonderful wish, in my opinion. Chance of dangerous adventure means that you're accepting the risk of failure. And if you're not willing to risk failure, you don't deserve to win. But when you do win, you win big, and that's true in a lot of other fields of human endeavor as well. Looking back on that stuff in those days, the Apollo program, it had it all. It had challenge, imagination, leadership, teamwork, technological breakthroughs, and also had its risk and its uncertainty, its, quote, chance of dangerous adventure, unquote. And it wasn't just the risk of dying. Men did die. Others were saved only through heroic efforts on that. Well, I think that's uh, Jack Schmidt down there standing by that big rock. I didn't pat that up when I should have. There's the Apollo 13 picture. Okay. It wasn't just dying. Men did die. And there you're looking at something that really sweated, we really sweated out back home on Apollo 13. And they, they made it back. All of the Apollo missions returned to Earth. And we had uh, six landings. Twelve men walked on the moon. And we advanced men's knowledge in dozens of fields of endeavor. And each mission was uncertain until splashdown. So that certainly met Delage's definition of adventure. The world, the world saw Apollo as a technical achievement by men who work and think like machines. But I assure you, we weren't computers or robots. We were warm, feeling, emotional, committed individuals. And 500 years from now, only one event of the 20th century is going to stand the test of time. Man on the moon. I've heard him refer a couple times today or yesterday on this. Uh, I think in history that that's the only thing that they will think about in, in this uh, generation back when it completed. That was the most spiritually uplifting event in our lifetime. For a brief period during the time of Apollo, our society felt good about itself again. We felt together. We felt supreme in our ability to accomplish anything that we set our minds to. It was an adventure that expanded our human experience and it proudly proclaimed to the world that we accepted no limits on what we could accomplish. As astronauts at that time, we were at the tip of that spear, and we got the glory uh, of the event. But I have to tell you, there was a lot more than us involved in that. The uh, success of Apollo was due to the collective efforts of about 400,000 members of a team in government and private industry. That's just a picture there of, uh, that's Wally Sharon and I arriving at North American Rockwell for the people that worked on the spacecraft. We had practically lived there. One, one year I was uh, on the road, most of it there, 276 days out of that particular year. But <coughs> against this enormous odds with the whole world watching a group of engineers, scientists, and managers accepted the challenge and took the risk. And the commercial spin-offs from the technologies that were developed to make a lunar landing possible 50 years ago, they're providing a financial return. Even today, we are using and loving a lot of the fallouts from that preparation. The, uh, unfortunately, uh, being politically correct has, uh, has a growing influence, and many look for absolute assurance that something can be done before committing to do it. It's a long shot. Well, I have to tell you, exploration is not about eliminating risk. It's about managing risk. Today, the grand aspirations are frequently at the mercy of politicians, one of the most risk-averse segments of our society. And we can't just be politically correct. We have to be willing to do what is right. 
even if that isn't popular. And we've certainly learned over the years, too, that safety can never be guaranteed when you're exploring the unknown. And we all <coughs> explorers have always been willing to die for, the eff for their efforts. Otherwise, it simply cannot happen. And when Magellan set out from uh, Spain to explore the globe, he, the globe, he left with five ships and 270 sailors. When they returned three years later, they had only one of those original ships. Magellan was gone. He'd been killed. And only 18 of those original sailors were still alive. What happened is the Apollo program brought together thousands with a shared dream and supreme confidence. They were dedicated, motivated, and committed uh, individuals. They were willing to accept whatever risk was involved to get the job done in those days. Initially, that was all, the whole Apollo program was all in our minds. And what was accomplished? Well, we staggered other men's minds and expanded our universe. We showed that if you're willing to dare greatly and risk failure, you can change man's view of his future forever. Personally, I feel very fortunate to have lived when I did, and I am proud to have played a small role in a historic accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you, do, you, do you think I'm still smart enough to answer a question? Yeah. So we'll, we'll, go ahead. we'll go ahead and take a couple, okay? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're short on time, but we do have time for a few quick questions. Does everybody know everything? I don't. Hi, Walt. Um, Gene Krantz famously said to all the flight controllers after Apollo 1 that they had to be tough and competent. What, Is there Gene Krantz said what? So Gene Krantz said to all of the flight controllers that they had to remain tough and competent after Apollo 1. Was anything said to the astronauts? Uh, I thought our Capcom could handle what he was doing just fine. They might have been, every once in a while, you might make some maybe minor mistake that, that bothers somebody. But in general, the operators that we had inside and outside of the spacecraft, they were excellent. We had one of those uh, Capcoms who was uh, so lucky that he's now sitting down here. <laughs> I can't see him. <laughs> he, we have one of those with us. He was, he was there for uh, Apollo 11. Any other questions? Brian. I had to play the drums. I couldn't play the other uh, okay, very simple question. Throughout all of this, what was your favorite moment? What's your favorite memory? What's my favorite moment, favorite memory? I think it's the first time I've been asked exactly that, that question. But my favorite moment must have been when we finally splashed down <laughs> in the ocean. Uh, but it was, it was kind of interesting because there's the public at large knows so little about a lot of things that kind of bothered us here and there. And I'll never forget, uh, on re-entry, we had total cloud coverage. And uh, one of the things you're looking for on that is you're looking for your parachutes. You'd like to see them when they are. Can I, and then the, the, the previous shoot, shoot came off about 22,000 square feet, uh, 22,000 feet. And... Uh, 
we did we couldn't couldn't see them just even that and so we noticed that uh, we slowed down a little bit so we thought oh okay uh, next thing we're gonna look for is the main chutes to come out at about 10 or 11 thousand feet got down there couldn't see them they opened up couldn't see them but we were able to track the the descent rate, and so we started breathing a little sigh of relief. We finally broke out of those clouds. We, it had our confidence because we were, had calculated our rate of descent. We broke out right down around 500 feet. In fact, they had moved the aircraft carrier that was picking us up. They had moved it about five miles away because they could, they could tell. They could see where we were coming down. And so uh, that's when we breathed a sigh of relief when we we could finally see the chutes, and we're instantly down on the ground, and we instantly turn upside down, and Don Isley, who was supposed to be the guy that went down there and made a change we could make that would up, write us up, he just started, and he said, uh, are you feeling sick? And I says, no. He says, well, I'm getting sick. Can you do this? So I had to get down, and I almost got sick because I had to change that switch down there. Huh. Okay. <laughs>